So thanks for everybody that came and signed the photo release form. What I'm going to be covering in today's lecture is structure from motion photogrammetry. We've talked about it off and on in different classes throughout the term, but this is really going to focus on what it is and what you can do with it and how it's a little bit different from aerial photogrammetry that we've done. So in this lecture, I've put up essentially the headline that we're going to do. I sent this in an email to you before the lecture with a few links we're going to use. We're going to go with an introduction. I'm going to introduce the learning objectives, so what you should get out of this lecture as a student. Pre-assessment, so I'm going to ask you some questions that may change the direction of what we're going to do in terms of the practical portion of it. The actual presentation, so that's where I'm going to talk about what structure for motion is. I'm going to explain or demonstrate the proper method of collecting imagery for small objects. We're going to go through some of the processing workflow, and then you're going to practice that. You're going to get in groups of two or maybe one to two. Take one of the objects I have here, the GPS antennas, and take pictures of it yourself, right? And I've sent you some links that you can download, some free software that I'm going to talk about in the lecture, where you can post-process those imagery, images at home and generate a model of that object. Then we're going to do a little post-assessment, uh, just to see if you learn anything from the lecture, and then a summary of what the lecture is. <clears throat> so, the basic idea of doing the structure of motion photogrammetry is to be able to generate or create 3D models. So what you're seeing up here is an exact idea of that, except it's done using aero photogrammetry rather than a camera. So it's on a bigger object rather than a smaller object. So to give you another idea of what this will look like, I'll bring up something that I've done. This is that exact model, process in context, context capture. So this was collected using Phantom 4 it's okay. So the same principles I'm going to talk about now using your phone on small objects is applied to aero photogrammetry. So you can create these really realistic 3D models, and this is all done from images, right? That's all of that's used for. So the focus for what we're going to do is these small objects. And these are two images that I did with a copy mode that I used to store my pens, and you're going to do with these GPS antennas. This was done using an iPhone, and this was done using a digital SLR. Just so you can see the difference in the different types of cameras and sensors, and what you can actually do just with your phone, right? Which is what you're going to practice in today's class. As long as you collect the images the correct way and have the right software, you can create these types of realistic models with a very cheap sensor. So how does this actually relate to what we've been doing in aero photogrammetry? Well, the concepts we're gonna talk about in terrestrial photogrammetry for sparse point clouds or structure for motion and how to recreate structures. The aero photogrammetry processing software such as PIX40, which you're using in your term project, does exactly the same thing as I'm gonna discuss here, just on a bigger scale with aerial imagery. So when you go through the PIX40 processing, the initial processing stage, where it does those match points and key points, that is applying that structure for motion of algorithm to find those key points. That calculates the position of the camera from that and then compares that to what you have in the GPS and IMU. So the exact same algorithm, or very similar to the same algorithm, that you're going to use for small objects is applied to terrestrial pho aerial photogrammetry. So it's the same concept used to both. It's just a structure for motion, and I want to get into more detail later, allows you to use a much cheaper sensor rather than something like a Phantom 4, which is $10,000. You can use a cell phone camera or something even cheaper to do a similar thing. So what does this mean to you as a geomatics student? So why is this important? There's two reasons why this is important. One, the biggest push right now in the geospatial industry is this 
digital twin or structure for motion or digital copies of processes or buildings or structures, right? So if I was to quickly jump out of this and go into GMAX International Magazine. So it's a very popular, well-read magazine. Most of the main features you see that pop up on the first news feed all have to do with 3D mapping, all have to do with digital twin production, either from structural <coughs> photogrammetry or from aerial photogrammetry. This is a really cool project that I'll send to you after. They essentially created a digital copy of an old T2, creating an app that you can actually explore if that looks like on your phone. Right? So it's really important because a lot of the focus on the geospatial industry right now, when you look at these featured case studies, using a UAV and 380 3D software to create those 3D products. Uh, welcome to the new geospatial that deals with creating 3D models of seafloor, right? Going all the way over here, using a UAV photogrammetry for city planning. So everything is starting to involve these digital copies and digital twins of structures, objects, entire cities. Because having that copy allows you to do a lot more and you can collect a lot of information really, really quickly. So jumping back to this here with the iPhone and the LiDAR. Oops. There we go. <clears throat> Specifically with the phone, because of the advances in the, in the camera and having LiDARs built into your phones, they're now starting to, geospatial industry is now starting to tap into that for creating these models. So the new iPhone 12 and Pro and Max and the 13 Pro and Max and the iPad has a built-in LiDAR in it by section ranging along with the camera sensor. So Pix4D has come out with this ViDoc system and a Pix4D catch, catch software you can attach an RTK antenna to an iPad that has built-in LiDAR and do real-time models with that iPad or with that phone. So this antenna uses what's known as an N-trip service, so you get real-time connections coming into that. You connect that to your iPad and use this pix 4 d cache app, which is free. So it essentially ties that geospatial data to the pictures you're taking, and then the software combines essentially the picture and the LiDAR and the geo information to create a geo reference model. So you collect it inside this app and then you post process it, and pro post -process it in Pix4D Mapper, which we use already for aerial photogrammetry. So the industry is recognizing how good these sensors are and how you can essentially give your clients this type of modeling in their hand, right? rather than having to buy really, really expensive software and platforms. So the lesson objectives for this lecture, by the end of this lecture, you're gonna be able to plan pressure photogrammetry for reconstructing small objects. So something like this GPS antenna, or an old total station, or a bug, or whatever it is you wanna create. The idea behind here is to show you the proper method for doing a small object. Those same principles can be pushed to bigger, but the planning is a little bit different. You're gonna be able to capture that terrestrial photogrammetry for structure for motion. So once you teach how to do it, you're gonna practice it, so you're gonna be able to apply it to different objects. And the third one is you're gonna be able to post-process that collected imagery to generate 3D models. So we're gonna go through all of these aspects in this lecture. Planning, capturing, the post-processing I'm gonna get you to do after, but I'm gonna show you how to get the software and the software you're gonna to use to do it. 